I'm going to bring up Adam Cooper. He is, the, he is the manager for the Institute for Electric Efficiency of the Edison Electric Institute, which has been, uh, which has been mentioned before. Um, he manages the Ener Electric Efficiency Research Projects uh, here at IEE. Prior to joining IEE, Mr. Cooper was a consultant that developed regional economic analysis in the fields of environmental regulation, tax policy, economic development, transportation, and the automotive industry. Mr. Cooper is a member of DOE, DOE's SEC Action Network, Consumer Information and Behavior and Utility Motivation Subcommittee Working Groups. That's a mouthful. Uh, Mr. Cooper, and this is very funny because um, he seems to have been following my wife's path. Mr. Cooper received a Master's in Public Policy from the University of Michigan and a Bachelor of Arts in Economics and History from Brandeis University. Um, he will be talking uh, on just this basically on what codes and standards programs are. Now let me get, take a second here to... Um, thank you, guys. All right, well, thank you. Um, I'm Adam Cooper. I have a little bit of a cold, so excuse me if I'm a little muffled or sinusy. Pardon me. Um, so, I guess briefly, IEE was, uh, since to give you the kind of background on IEE and who, who it is, what it does, IEE is a, a program of the Edison Foundation, and we, um, we basically help um, investor-owned utilities, um, <coughs> energy efficiency advocates, and uh, regulators understand the, the potential from um, energy efficiency programs, dynamic pricing schemes, and um, we started to look at codes and standards about two years ago for scoping out a uh, potential paper uh, where we evaluated the um, energy savings from um, essentially adopting some of the um, cap and trade regulation that was circling DC a couple of years ago. That, that kind of fizzled. Um, so our update was to look at some, again, uh, aggressive or moderate code and applying standards adoptions. I know that the, the room is mostly focused on building energy codes, but, um, and, and I think that uh, the, the states um, are looking at energy codes, at, along with the utilities are looking at energy codes as perhaps being a little bit more serviceable for meeting energy efficiency goals. Um, but we, we also looked at applying standards because they happen to have a very large um, potential opportunity for energy savings. Um, but uh, given, uh, I, I guess just given the, um, given the, the, uh, the room today, you know, I'll try to keep most comments to energy codes. So our first report in 2011 looked at uh, a moderate or aggressive pathway to achieve energy savings through codes and standards relative to AEO 2011. So it was a scenario modeling that we undertook with uh, Global Energy Partners. Um, we had uh, sort of insights and information provided by uh, Steve Nadell of ACEEE and Steve Rosenstock of EEI. So you kind of had two opposite personalities um, informing this study with uh, ACEEE's vision of what, what can happen, what should happen, and a little bit more of a conservative approach from uh, EEI. And we kind of married the two um, to inform our moderate scenario, which is more or less an EEI vision of the world, versus an aggressive scenario, which more or less is a ACEEE version of the world. Um, a couple months later, we uh, we looked at, we want to take this kind of big picture, what's the potential, and bring it down to a little bit more of an actionable um, set of steps that utilities could either consider or have already engaged in to um, claim credit for savings through building energy codes and also uh, applying uh, efficiency standards. Um, so some of the results from our study um, are that uh, relative to AEO, our, um, our total savings uh, were 9 to 14 percent of forecasted baseline usage. Most of the savings do fall into standards. Um, so in the moderate scenario, about two-thirds of the savings 
uh, potential are um, through uh, equipment standards and about one third through building energy codes. Um, the size of these savings is actually, uh, regardless of how you split the savings, the size of the savings is compelling. Um, but also the distribution should make you think, you know, uh, from a utility perspective, that you know, yes, codes are an opportunity, but also standards have a have a place in the solution as well. Um, another sort of just image from our from our report is um, in uh, in our moderate case scenario, we basically flattened demand um, out in 2025. Um, again, remember, you know, one third of that flattening of demand is through building energy codes, um, going above and beyond what uh, AEO forecasted, and also we assumed uh, full compliance. So you know, that was a uh, sorry, full being 100 percent or say 90 percent. Just picking a number out of my head. No, it was <laughs> <laughs> it was full. It was 100 percent, not 90 percent, and not a plan to get to 90 percent, but modeled at effective 100 percent. Um, now, if you want to cut the number in half, it's still a pretty big number, or, or multiply by 0.9, it's, it's still large. Um, but that's that's kind of where um, where we see opportunity for energy savings is, um, you know, aggressive adoption, of building energy codes, um, and also uh, aggressive enforce or well enforcement of building energy codes. Who does that is uh, a question right now within the, within the industry. It really shouldn't be, from my perspective, a utility um, function, but a, the utility industry itself does have some resources and some interests in, in achieving these, uh, these sorts of uh, outcomes, conditional to having business models in place that support energy efficiency, um, broad stroke, be it through a lighting program or through a building energy codes program. So kind of Stepping back a little bit from this big slide and this big opportunity, um, there's about 50% of the nation, um, the states in the nation, with uh, energy efficiency resource standards. So, sort of goals and targets that are driving uh, utilities to invest in energy efficiency programs. Um, so, it, in the recent times, it's been the utilities have been able to meet these goals, mostly through um, lighting programs. Lighting has been a very strong um, achiever in the Midwest, but these goals are ramping up, and there's also caps on how much utilities can spend on these programs. Um, there also has to be financial models in place to, um, to fairly compensate the utilities for um, declining uh, revenue from energy efficiency efforts. So there's, you know, there's a little bit more to play than just the opportunity here. There also has to be an environment where energy efficiency is supported in terms of recovery of direct capital expenses. So that'd be things like, you know, training for, um, you know, code, you know, code officials, developing manuals. So the actual administrative or um, capital outlays for energy efficiency, buying the light bulbs per se, or for instance. Um, then there's also the issue of um, basically declining um, electric sales through energy efficiency measures that have to be uh, compensated or uh, adjusted to reflect the efforts of the utility given their past investments and in other fixed assets. So that's one and two steps in this three-step sort of leg of an or three-step stool, three-leg stool, excuse me, for energy efficiency. The third would be performance incentives, which essentially treat energy efficiency, demand-side resource equivalent to a supply-side resource from an ROE or bottom line perspective. So having that said, about half the states are pursuing energy efficiency with some fervor, and the goals are increasing, and they're increasing pretty severely. Um, Isaac mentioned that uh, in a couple of years there's going to be some states in the Midwest with a 2% energy efficiency goal. In Pennsylvania, I believe in 36 months, so in three years, there will be um, a 3% energy efficiency requirement um, you know, relative to sales. So things are moving fast and um, we're running into 
a, uh, a state where programs, I heard earlier, you know, CFLs are sort of, you know, tapped out, we've reached market saturation. That's not quite true, but the margin or that, the, the differential in terms of baseline versus the energy savings from a CFL program is shrinking because of the standards. Um, the, the industry is about average 20 to 20, 25 percent market saturation. You know, in states that have been doing it longer, like California, Pacific Northwest, you have higher saturation. But um, anyhow, there's still opportunity there. But given changes in um, federal legislation, the, the go-to program lighting is kind of, you know, it's still going to be attractive. But utility uh, program managers are thinking about diversifying their portfolio. And that's where codes and standards are sort of coming into the conversation. Um, so, from our research, we found that, you know, just a moderate change to code standards could offset or dampen electric growth um, forecasted up to 2025. That's not a trivial uh, finding, and that's, that's actually kind of alarming. So we need to get these business mechanisms in place to, for, for the utility interests to see these gains. So I'll move away from that sort of soapbox and talk more about what I, I see as utility involvement in uh, building energy code programs. Um, and uh, some examples that um, you know, I, I get my uh, you know, sort of information or thoughts from. In California, um, California ran a, a Codes and Standards program as part of their three-year energy efficiency portfolio. And it accounted for about 10% of, uh, well, they, they added a year. California always kind of adds a year when they don't know, you know, there are like budget issues. We don't know what to do. It's continuing a resolution or whatever. But uh, they added a year, so it's actually a four-year cycle. Um, so they, they basically met 10% of, the, of their program goals through a Codes and Standards program. Uh, this, this program um, uh, saved a lot of energy at very low costs. Um, you know, it's, it's, it was remarkable in my eyes to, to look at the cost effectiveness of this program. And we're, you know, we're talking uh, just, you know, uh, you know, a, a couple, you know, couple million dollars, and um, in California, and I don't want to steal any of your sort of information on what they do, but so California does a, they, they kind of take, um, they usually take a holistic approach to codes and standards, where they, they really think not, where are we doing this year or next year, but where are we doing the next code cycle? So for this upcoming round, um, you know, 2012 was extended to 2013, so let's talk about 2014 through 2016. Um, today they're thinking about, um, you know, what can we as a utility do to support that building code that will be in place in 2013 through 2016? What can we do in terms of setting new standards so they have, um, for non-federally covered appliances, California works, the utilities work with the California Energy Commission and the uh, Public Utility Commission to authorize funds for research and, and testing of um, higher efficiency standards for appliances. That's maybe not this room's interest, but that's kind of like a big opportunity for utilities. Um, and it's also a, a big help um, for the federal process as well. On the code side, um, you know, they also engage in training and um, advocacy, both at the state level and at the federal level. Um, right now, there's sort of, you know, a question mark about, you know, how to, dip, you know, how to attribute savings from federal um, building, a, you know, federal codes work, um, ICC, IECC uh, efforts back onto um, state level um, effects. So, you know, when you have a, a state the size of California, they get involved in all sorts of manners, you know, beyond their um, geographic boundaries. In Massachusetts, um, they have a, a green communities program, and one of the, um, uh, one of the kind of, um, you know, things that they have to do to become a green communities member is, um, is adopt a uh, stretch code, an optional stretch code to their their standard building um, code, and so uh, the utilities 
help develop sort of a standard offer. Um, so you know, it kind of it's a consistent consistency is important when you have um, a utility and lots of municipalities and the state governments and more agencies all trying to work together. Having kind of a standard offer is uh, sensible in my eyes and is working in Massachusetts. Um, so there's one option, it's an optional appendix, but there's only kind of one out there. So, you know, you hear about the states modifying this, you know, whatever your version, you know, building energy code, and then they say, and it's kind of similar to this one, and, you know, you get into the technical differences, which um, I'm not an expert in, but it seems like that's a lot to manage. So having a standard offer um, actually, I think, um, increase the uptake rate and allows for more energy savings. So when you guys think about, you know, um, you know, what's the relationship for a utility, what would be a good relationship, developing standard offers, sort of consistent, um, you know, appendices to building energy code or a consistent uh, avenue for utility engagement so that they can then staff up on their side so that it would be the same for County A, County B, County C. Um, so consistency and standard offer packages makes sense to me. Um, their appendix, uh, their stretch code was 20% above the, or the, the state um, base code, just for your reference. In Minnesota, um, the Next Generation Act allows for energy savings from building codes to count towards another uh, increasing energy efficiency resource standard. Um, we actually have another speaker touching on that issue, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave that one to him. Arizona, um, Arizona, uh, Arizona's interesting. They, they have, they, they're kind of, they're kind, it's great that they're doing this. It was kind of unexpected that Arizona, um, allowed, and it's only for building energy codes, so we can take the whole standards, you know, the, the applying standards out the window. This is only for building energy codes, so this is, this is kind of cool for you guys, you know. One third of energy savings from building energy codes can count towards energy, or electric energy efficiency standard, their, their, um, their goals. But it's, they are again kind of like a, a home rule state where every municipality is a little bit different and for the two or three, the Salt River Project, Tucson Electric Power, and Arizona Public Service. So you kind of have, you know, the, the larger players and then you have, you know, smaller medium catwalks. But, um, you know, there, there isn't a sort of standard offer in place. It's, it's one by one by one kind of working with each, each municipality, which I find may be cumbersome or, or a barrier. So, great opportunity there, you know, uh, they have to somehow, you know, you know, I mean, they have, to, Arizona is not exactly building as it once used to also, so the sort of the <coughs> opportunity has kind of diminished since maybe a few years ago, but building boom and busts occur. Anyhow, um, you know, I think this is a good opportunity for the, for the utilities, given the fact that it's kind of, you know, it, it, it's clearly stated what you're allowed to, you know, attribute in terms of code savings to your larger energy efficiency goal. Um, who, who, you know, kind of who claims it is, you know, fairly divided. You know, you only have a couple of utilities and they kind of, you know, you don't have too many cross-municipality issues um, in terms of the utility servicing one half of, you know, a county and another utility servicing another. But, um, you know, they're, they have great intentions, but it's not as fully developed as, um, you know, Massachusetts, California, or Minnesota. In the Pacific Northwest, um, they've been doing building energy codes for a while, you know, with support from uh, EPA, PNNL, um, the uh, Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance, uh, you know, so they have a, a long track record, and they are, um, you know, they've actually recorded 90% compliance, or Washington and Oregon has, so, you know, for those who say you can't reach this goal, it's, it's been reached.